And welcome to Tuesday on the Vince Colonnese Show. Without Vince, it's Michael Pelka. That's me. I'm sitting in for my buddy Vince Colonnese today and God willing tomorrow. And we'll try and get to everything today. Could there be a day with any more going on? Seriously. And I know a lot of people are already saying, hey, we're out of here. Well, Vince is one of them uh, taking the uh, Thanksgiving holiday. And weather's going to make it tough for those people who have to travel today. I'm watching all of the cables spinning around the cable news channels. And everybody's got the requisite reporter at the airport reminding everyone to pack their patients. Please, can we uh, can we stop with the pack your patients line? If you planned on traveling the day or two before Thanksgiving and then the day after, you knew what you were in for. So deal with it. But uh, as I said, there are many, many things going on in our world today. Uh, the, the most important one, I guess, is the news of the imminent hostage deal between Israel and Hamas. But... Um, As long as there are steps to go through and a terrorist organization with which to deal, there can be no surety that this this alleged deal will happen. And what does it include? 50 women and and children to be released. And, of course, the, the sarcastic mind says, well, how do they decide what a woman is if we don't know here in America? Yeah, I know just trying to make a point on another subject but 50 women and children to be released by Hamas into the hands of uh, I guess the Red Cross initially and the Red Cross reportedly going to have access to the remaining hostages for care and I, I'm I'm hoping we're going to get some hard information out of this because for weeks I for one have been worried that there aren't any hostages remaining alive For Hamas to say we have 50 that we're going to hand over, that to me is a little bit of a good sign. I honestly believe that since October 7th and the horrific terror attack on our friends in Israel, that Hamas really didn't care about the lives of the hostages. They only needed a few as currency, as human shields, as bargaining chips, whatever you want to call them. But now it appears like something is about to happen. The war cabinet had to vote on the deal first. Then the regular Israeli cabinet has to vote on that deal if it's approved by the war cabinet. And assuming it passes through the regular cabinet, then it goes to the, uh, the entire government. And there is a vote on it as if uh, both houses of our Congress had to vote. So we'll see what happens. We'll see what comes out. Maybe it happens while we are on the air today. And uh, by the way, according to what everyone's reporting, there will be three Palestinians, and we assume three members of Hamas among them, released in exchange for each of the 50. So that would be 150 Palestinians released in exchange. And doesn't seem like a fair deal, does it? Well, Israel wants its people back. And among them, many Americans, there are reports that there is a three-year-old American child who will be among the first 50 released, and let's hope so. If we only had a leader who had gone quite public with not just Hamas, but Iran and Hezbollah and said, uh, our people need to be released. This ain't our fight. And you harm one hair on the head of one of our American citizens, you will pay dearly. So... Uh, that's that's not the case. And I know some people say, well, how do you know? How do you know that didn't happen quietly? No, we know. We know. You think you think the guy in charge is capable of saying tough stuff like that? You think the guy who turned 81 years old yesterday is capable of, of being that solid, that strong? I, I'm old enough to remember yesterday when uh, 81-year-old Joe Biden wanted us to know some things about his birthday. I met the guy meets the entire family. And by the way, I, it's my birthday today, and they can actually sing birthday music. Yeah, they can actually sing birthday. Seriously, that's what the world sees. So I just don't know if, uh, if, the, 
if the, uh, the terror sponsors fear us as much as we need them to fear us. Um, hopefully. Now, we did have the U.S. firing back at Iran at the Iranian-backed groups today, and there was a, a press conference going on in the Pentagon as we were preparing for the show today. Uh, that press conference had some pretty interesting moments in it. Deputy Pentagon Press Secretary Sabrina Singh was talking about the proxies that have attacked the U.S. forces in the Middle East. Um, a hundred and I think it's 150 plus times this calendar year. But here's the interesting twist in that. At least 66 times since the middle of October. So it's not getting better. It's getting a lot worse. Iran has been more emboldened. Its proxies have been more emboldened at least 66 times since October and uh, causing some injuries to U.S. personnel. In that since case. I know you'll ask, U.S. forces have been attacked approximately 66 times since October 17th. Now, I, I have to stop her there. What's with the little snarky attitude at the beginning? Since I know you'll ask. Well, how about since the American media deserves full transparency? How about you're not walk into the room and, and, and with a snarky attitude? Since I know you'll ask. Yeah, how about you just tell us, here's the update. Since I know you'll ask, give me a break, lady. And since I know you'll ask, U.S. forces have been attacked approximately 66 times since October 17th, 32 separate times in Iraq, and 34 separate times in Syria. U.S. personnel have sustained approximately 62 injuries, but this does not include any injuries from last night's attack as they are still being evaluated. So we had another attack last night, and then we had a response this morning, apparently not a pre-planned response. It was an opportunity that we had a, uh, a C, an AC-130 in the area that saw the group of bad actors, the, the allegedly connected to Iran bad actors. So... Uh, at, at least we're starting to fire back. But 66 times Americans and American forces have come under attack just since October 17th, 10 days after the attack on Israel. And are we, are we doing anything to really stop Iran from funding it? No, we're not. We're freeing up other monies so Iran can continue sending money to its friends, its uh, proxies. In all of this. And at the same time, Hezbollah is, is tweaking Israel every single day, uh, trying to, uh, to draw Israel into a deeper conflict in, uh, in, in that region. And let's hope that doesn't get there. I, I, we don't need this expanded any further, but we need Israel to be allowed to finish the job. This may be a five-day, four-day, five-day ceasefire. But again, uh, there's there's nothing that has been uh, been solidified yet. Just what the proposed terms of the deal are. I still would like to make sure that if there are, in fact, 240 hostages, that we have a full accounting of of those people and proof of life, as they say. And meanwhile, at the same time, not to uh, not to uh, point out other problems happening around the world. Uh, but this kind of got uh, a little attention today in the Pentagon briefing, just a little attention. And then most of the networks cut away. So uh, I don't have many more details on this. We will look at this a little bit deeper. Uh, North Korea launched a spy satellite. Yes, Kim Jong-un now has his own spy satellite. And the people in Japan and South Korea, obviously very nervous about it. And uh, I, I'm guessing we're... We're waiting to see if there is a response to that and whether or not there is any um, information that can be garnered that's a troublesome to us with a North Korean spy satellite now hovering up in the, uh, up in the uh, stratosphere, atmosphere, wherever the heck it is. So many things to get to today. So many things. We will update you the minute something comes out on the uh, hostage negotiations, if there is any breakthrough on that. We're also looking at uh, what appears to be a shift in strategy from the Biden White House in how it is um, selling itself. Uh, yesterday, if you were paying attention during Joe Biden's 81st birthday, there was a significant shift in how Joe Biden marked the birthday 
versus his 80th birthday. If we go back a year ago, a year ago when Joe Biden turned 80, uh, he was kind of um, kind of irritated about it, it seemed. And I think there was a, um, a reporter that he looked at, to them and said, you don't think I know how old I am? As if to say, I get up every day and I feel 80 years old. We know he's got, he's got issues with his walk and his, uh, uh, is it spinal stenosis? He's got a problem. It, it's not easy getting old. Everybody's got to deal with it. But uh, it's the problem with the brain that bothers me. The problem with the slowness in the cognitive areas. So last year he was telling us how tough it was and how, how he was aware. And then we heard uh, yesterday how he talked about, hey, you know, it's tough turning 60 and got a laugh out of it. And then the White House posted a picture of a birthday cake that looked like a bonfire and decided to have fun with it. And Biden talked about turning 142 years old. So there's a definite shift in trying to paint Joe Biden in a more avuncular state, a more of a, hey, uh, he, he's young at heart. And uh, KJP even talked about it yesterday. We'll play a clip about uh, that moment as she talked about it. And uh, the press secretary didn't have a press conference today, so we'll, we'll give you um, some highlights from some other moments, as I said, with the Pentagon presser. Uh, we do have some of the push from the Biden administration to tell you just how good things are economically. And I know you're saying, wait, wait, what, what did you just say? How, how good things are economically? Yes. Yes, they want you to believe that you're better off than you are, than you think you are, than you feel you are. And you've got much more money in your pocket after you leave the grocery store or the gas station or wherever you're coming from. And they're out there pushing it with uh, people like uh, White House uh, top advisor uh, Jared Bernstein, who wants everybody to know just just how great things are this year. I think in areas where prices went up, you know, really uh, uh, a great deal and were highly elevated, you know, there you want to see prices come down, not just disinflation, but deflation. So let me hit you with a few numbers. So airline tickets down 13 percent over the past year. Car rentals, 10 percent. Eggs, 22 <laughs> percent. Thanksgiving dinner, to be a bit topical, uh, down four and a half percent with uh, with turkey down about six percent. That's deflation. That is lower prices in those areas. Now, if you only remember the last 12 months, that's great. But since... 2019, airfare is up 21%. Car rentals are up 17%. Eggs, 21%. Thanksgiving dinner, up 25%. Turkey, up 31.5%. So if your memory only goes back 12 months, everything looks rosy. But if you're like most of us, it's not quite so good. All right, you're welcome to join us at any time uh, during the conversation today. 888-630-9625, of course, is the number here on the Vince Colonnais Show. It's uh, Mike Opelka. That's me, my name. It is 25 minutes after the hour on this Tuesday. It feels like a, a, a midweek, like a Wednesday. And then tomorrow will feel like a Friday, right? Short week. Because of Thanksgiving, Mike Opelka is my name in for Vince, Vince Colonnais on the Vince Colonnais show. Uh, we're going to get into um, a little bit of a discussion just around the corner about what Elon Musk is doing with the uh, the evil empire of media matters for America. I am not a fan of media matters of America, having been having been targeted by them. When I worked at TheBlaze.com years ago, I understand what they're about, and uh, I'm very happy to see what Elon Musk has done living up to his promise. And, and we will talk with uh, John Daniel Davidson of The Federalist just around the corner about uh, the lawsuit, because there appears to be uh, some piling on by some significant other organizations who have decided that Media Matters does not work and play well with others. And deserves a little bit of uh, what what now is being called lawfare. You know, they call lawfare what's being done to Donald Trump by the Department of Justice. It's warfare using the legal system. So Media Matters looks like they're about to get a taste 
of of what uh, many of us in the conservative sphere have felt from from the left utilizing the law to keep us busy or drain us of our money, et cetera. But couldn't happen to a, a nicer bunch of weasels at Media Matters, and, and we'll dive into that as well. Um, I also have a confession to make that if I said it in a crowded room, if we were, if we were on Media Row at CPAC and uh, I was sitting there and, and other radio broadcasters in the conservative world were sitting there and I said, I have a big announcement to make. I, I agree with John Fetterman. People might stop uh, speaking and turn their heads and say, what? Yeah, I, I actually have on more than one occasion in the past couple of weeks agreed with the Fetter monster, the senator from Pennsylvania, the guy who got elected after not telling the voters that he had a pretty serious stroke and he got across the finish line and now is a senator, the guy who wears the hoodies and the shorts, uh, uh, even though the Senate has said, well, on voting days you have to pun put on your big boy pants and you have to dress like a grown-up. Uh, John Fetterman and I agree on something. And again, more than one thing. He, he's, uh, he's a big supporter of allowing Israel to do what it needs to do to crush Hamas. But there's something even bigger that uh, makes me, makes me kind of happy to say I, I can reach across the aisle and shake Senator Fetterman's hand and say, thank you for doing that. We'll get into it. We'll get into that. We'll get into what's going on with Media Matters and Elon Musk. That's next on the Vince Colonnay Show on WMAL. It is 3.34 on a Tuesday afternoon. And miserable weather out there, but then again, it's November. And uh, if you're indoors, good for you. You don't have to deal with it. It's Mike Opelka. Setting in for Vince Colonnais on the Vince Colonnais show on the Thanksgiving Eve Eve. Yeah, tomorrow's Thanksgiving Eve. I'll be here again tomorrow, God willing. Uh, trying to get to everything as we keep our eyes out for any news breaking on the imminent hostage deal we're told about. But there, there are other stories that we've been tracking. And this one's, um, one's kind of got some legs to it. Last week there was a, um, a little bit of a of outrage that was triggered by Media Matters for America, a far-left group that is, um, in my opinion, a, a bunch of troublemakers who are just out to silence voices that don't agree with them. And I know this from experience because years ago when I worked at TheBlaze.com and we would attend conferences like CPAC or any other conservative event, Media Matters would assign, and I'm using air quotes with my fingers, reporters to follow conservative outlets around and try and get gotcha moments. And they'd ask uh, interesting trick questions. And uh, they attempted with me, and they attempted as well when I worked there, Dana Lash was there too, they attempted to entrap Dana as well. So I'm familiar with the tactics, but... What they had tried to do with Elon Musk last week by trying to paint Elon Musk as anti-Semitic and trying to say that uh, he was advancing content that supported anti-Semitism and kind of paint him with that Nazi brush. Well, it, they may have picked the wrong guy because over the weekend Elon uh, warned that he was going to take some action, and yesterday he did. To, to grasp it fully... You need a bigger brain than mine. So we, we reached out to the Federalist, and John Daniel Davidson is joining us today. Mr. Davidson, welcome to the program, sir. Hey, thanks for having me on. Now, um, John, have you experienced the joy of dealing directly with Media Matters yourself? <laughs> Not uh, in the way that you have, it sounds like, but I know all about them. And they're really just part of this whole ecosystem of left-wing activist groups that, as you say, their sole reason for existence is to shut down and deplatform anybody who disagrees with them and, and everybody on the right. And that's what they did here. That's what they tried to do here. And they're pretty well 
funded, it seems, because they've been around for a long time. Um, do we have any idea who's the who's the big funder behind something like Media Matters? Uh, well, there's a number of, of funders behind groups like this, these nonprofits. Uh, a lot of times they're funded by anonymous uh, donors, just like some you know nonprofit groups on the right are. Uh, the difference between the groups on the right and groups on the left is that groups like Media Matters for America try to go after people's advertisers, uh, publications, in this case, uh, X or Twitter's advertisers, and they seem to have succeeded. IBM, Apple, a bunch of big name advertisers pulled their funding and pulled their ads from Twitter after this sort of bogus false report came out where Media Matters tried to say to these advertisers that their ads were appearing alongside sort of Nazi-ish and white supremacist uh, content on Twitter. And, and of course, none of it was true. It was totally manipulated uh, and, and totally contrived, which, which uh, Elon Musk and Twitter executives quickly exposed. And that's what we read in the lawsuit this morning. And what I'm looking at when, when you see this happening and you, you think um, Media Matters would have known better, uh, they're dealing with a bunch of tech heads. The people who, right. who are operating Twitter X certainly understand what's going on in the background of, of their giant computer setup and they understand what the algorithms are doing. And you, you would think that uh, Media Matters would know that if they're going to try and manipulate the system, that it would be caught. And it, I, I'm guessing there, is a, there's, there are digital footprints to prove that Media Matters was, in fact, trying to game the system here. Yeah, it sounds like there, there were and that they weren't very hard to follow, especially for the brain trust at Twitter. Uh, they said that they would be filing this lawsuit uh, over the weekend uh, earlier today or uh, yesterday I should say they did file it and they sort of laid out what Media Matters did and you would you would have thought since Media Matters has been around for a while that one of their lawyers would have waved them off of this before they got too far down the road but essentially they all they did was create some fake Twitter accounts uh, and then try to uh, follow controversial or you know, alt-right or white supremacist content that they were able to find on Twitter, uh, and then just refresh and repopulate ads and do it over and over and over, 13 to 15 times more than the average user. So across literally millions of refreshes and impressions until they finally got uh, a paid ad by like IBM or Oracle or Apple to appear next to a tweet that was controversial, and then they screenshotted it. As Elon Musk and Twitter pointed out, you can do this with any social media program. It's just manipulation of the algorithm. But what it does and what it's designed to do is impute guilt to Elon Musk and Twitter for every offensive thing that a Twitter user says, which is ridiculous and which, uh, which these left-wing groups do all the time, try to assign, uh, associate platforms and media outlets with third-party content that they have nothing to do with. Uh Correct me if I'm wrong, but what what Media Matters was trying to do to, I guess, hyper simplify it is if a uh, if a radical white supremacist neo-Nazi walked into a store and then walked out to say that, hey, that store is patronized by neo-Nazis. And that that was one random incident out of hundreds, thousands, whatever of customers may have walked into the store. And, and, by, then, and then to, go, yeah, go exactly, to extend your analogy, then you then Media Matters would go to uh, all of the suppliers or other major customers or clients of that store and say, hey, did you know that this store, uh, you know, had a neo-Nazi walk into it and um, and a neo-Nazi bought something there? Do you want to be associated with a store like that? Do you want to do business with this merchant? I don't think you do. I don't think everybody, uh, you know, who does business with you would like to know about that. That's what this is. It's a shakedown operation. Uh, and, and they've rightly been sued now for defamation and some other penalties. And apparently the attorney general of Texas, Ken Paxton, is looking into filing charges as well. Well, uh, we're, we're talking with John Daniel Davidson over at The Federalist about his piece on uh, Media Matters and uh, Elon Musk and the suit that Elon Musk has filed. And as you mentioned, uh, the attorney general of Texas is now opening an investigation 
into Media Matters. And uh, yeah. correct me if I'm wrong, did we hear the Trump Organization was also looking at actions against other social media outlets or other people like Media Matters? Yeah, I didn't see anything as concrete as what Ken Paxton uh, announced. I also know the, the Attorney General of Missouri had said earlier over the weekend that, that his team was also looking into it. And I think this is long overdue. You know, the, these left-wing groups, you know, hide behind the fig leaf of being quote-unquote watchdog groups. But the only thing that they're watching out for is anyone who disagrees with them so they can go after their business model. And I mentioned this today, you know, we've been a victim of this ourselves, like you uh, at The Federalist. We had a, a group uh, in the United Kingdom come up with a bogus report that, you know, Center for Countering Digital Hate or some such that targeted us for basically, you know, having strong opinions about COVID and the Black Lives Matter riots of the summer of 2020. And, and, and they shopped this to NBC, which then went to Google and said, oh, hey, do you sure you want Google ads to be running on The Federalist? Uh, and it became its own news cycle for one media outlet to do this to another. Uh, but the common denominator here are these left-wing activist groups like Media Matters and, this, and this, this left-wing group in the U.K. that try to do this with us. And the only point, the only purpose of this is to shut down free speech and, and, and the free press. That's, that's the purpose of it, and it needs to be called out. And they're, they're doing it by attempting to choke the money stream, and that is typically yeah. what these kinds of organizations do is to cut off the funding to uh, yeah. starve you to death. I, I know they did it with us at The Blaze. I know they've done it with several other organizations. Um, d does Media Matters, and, and I'm going way off script here on this, uh, John, does Media Matters fall in line or fall into the same category as somebody like the Southern Poverty Law Center, who has also targeted people and trying to make uh, racial claims against them, do the similar thing, or the Center for American Progress? Are they, are they all part of the same category? type of group yeah they, they all are part of the same ecosystem of left-wing activists and and really sort of uh institutionalized thugs that as you say go after the advertisers they try to de-platform and demonetize and deprive outlets and institutions and in this case social media platforms like twitter of being able to operate uh by by going after the the funders the advertisers it's dirty business, and uh, I think you're right what you said at the beginning. They may have picked the wrong guy in Elon Musk because uh, if there's anyone who has sort of the uh, money and the clout and the interest to really go after these guys, it's him. Yeah, uh, Elon Musk has the budget to outspend yeah. Media Matters on this one. Um, and at the end of the day, um, is Musk able to say, hey, we lost, is he able to monetize this and say we lost – IBM, we lost Apple, we lost whomever, and they can sue for damages on this. Um, is it possible to bankrupt Media Matters, or do they just pop up again as another entity with a different name? Well, I hope it's possible to bankrupt Media Matters specifically because of how toxic of an organization they are, but also so it will encourage other groups perhaps not to go and do likewise. But to your larger point, yes, this, this money from left-wing mega donors is always going to be there. And if you, you know, it's like whack-a-mole. If, you, if you're able to sue one group like Media Matters into oblivion, another one under another name will pop up somewhere. Uh, it's a constant fight, at, and it's going to ramp up uh, and the, you know, ahead of the 2024 election. I should say, too, the only reason that they're going after Twitter is because they don't control Twitter the way they did the last election cycle. Uh, they're not going to be able to suppress another Hunter Biden laptop story going into 2024. And so their tactic instead is to go after Elon Musk, to go after Twitter, to try to destroy it because they can't control it. That's what this is really all about. Yeah, they should have watched the uh, interview with Elon Musk when when he was asked, why did you buy this? You know, why did you put yeah. 40 plus billion dollars of your own money into something that you knew was not going to make money? And he said to protect free speech and. And there's yeah. a guy who, who doesn't care. And the, the most difficult fight you could get into is against an opponent who doesn't care because they're not going to stop. <laughs>
It's, That's right. He's not in it. Yeah, he doesn't need the money. I don't think he cares how much money he loses going after media uh, matters. Uh, they're they're, they're going to steal the full full force of Elon Musk now, uh, and they deserve it. And I, I hope you're right that anyone else is thinking, hey, this is a good idea, will step <laughs> aside. And I also hope we'll see more um, reports of people who've said, hey, uh, IBM, you, you left. Well, we're going to spend money here. And they're starting to post those numbers. Uh, it's, it's along the lines of a boycott, the people who will step up and actually spend yeah. now. Uh, because uh, Twitter X, whatever you want to call I'm still calling it Twitter. It's hard to change when you're my age. Uh, but it's, uh, it's hopeful that people are actually now putting their money back in to Twitter. That's a good sign. The, the article is called Elon Musk Should Sue Media Matters Into Oblivion. It is uh, John Daniel Davidson's piece on The Federalist. Uh, thank you, John, for joining us. Appreciate the clarity on this, and I hope you're right. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And there he goes. Uh, and this is a great story. And I will tell you, watch Ken Paxton, too. The uh, Texas Attorney General has opened up an investigation into Elon Musk, uh, not into Elon Musk, but what's being done to Elon Musk by Media Matters. And if you don't know who they are, you need to be aware because they are part of a group that doesn't play fair, especially if you disagree with them. Uh, all right. I mentioned it earlier. John Fetterman and I, I know, Democrat John Fetterman, the Fetter monster, as people call him, because, you know, he has kind of a lurch look to him. Uh, he is um, he's someone I've actually come to agree with on something, not on everything. I'll explain what it is I'm talking about just around the corner. I love Larry O'Connor, and I mean that, truly. Truly one of my favorite people in the whole wide world, just not on the radio, just a good guy. It's Mike Opelka in for Vince Colonnais on the Vince Colonnais show. And I just learned uh, about Vince's uh, uh, bourbon addiction. We have to talk. We have to have a talk about this. And we'll get into it. And I also have to tell you the details behind my uh, recent agreement with John Fetterman on something. But... The phones are actually busy today, 888-630-9625. Walt is on the phone from Gaithersburg. Hello, Walt. Welcome to the program. What is on your mind, sir? Yes, I wanted to give your listeners some additional information. You were talking about Media Matters, SPLC, yes, Black sir. Lives Matter. And, uh, there is a website where this organization just researches people and organizations with readily available data. And the website is www.discoverthenetworks.org. And there you can find out, like, if it's tied to Source or China or whoever the left-wing players are or even right-wing players. So you can look up a place like Black Lives Matters, and you'll find Patricia Kohler's there, of course, who bought all those mansions. Yep. You can look up SPLP. So it's called Discover the Networks, one word. Discoverthenetworks.org, so we know it's not a commercial entity. It's a nonprofit itself. That's, it's that's a nonprofit, great. Yeah. I guess you can donate money to help them research. And, of course, Source has about 200 orgs, including the League of Women Voters. He, yeah. he donates to. Soros has a gigantic empire, and uh, when, when one gets caught, they just shift the focus to another. And, and Van Jones was in the middle of all of it. But that's great. Discoverthenetworks.org. If you want to do a little research yourself, and I encourage you, you need to do the research yourself. Because if anyone on the left calls you out, you want to have the receipts. You want to have the street cred to look them in the eye and go, oh, yeah? Well, let me tell you this. And just like that, I've, I've run out the clock in the first hour. So I'm going to have to hold my John Fetterman story till the second hour. So much more to get to. So much more to cover today. It's Mike Opelka in for the one and only Vince Colonnais on the Vince Colonnais Show on WMAL.